Ethan Laundry. He is a second year master student at the University of Gulf. He is also a research assistant at the Intelligent Adaptive Interventions Lab of the University of Toronto. His interests are computer science education, problem solving, and adaptive experimentation. So please welcome Nathan. I gotta say, you're all way better at following instructions than I am. There's no way I could have followed that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's hope I don't forget my speech. So I, honestly, when I come up here, I'm always so nervous. Like the the weeks leading up, I'm like, nah, man, I got this. I could wing a speech, no problem. And then like two days before, I'm like, I can't wing a speech, man. I don't have one. So I wrote this on Thursday, <laughs> and now I'm freaking out. But hopefully it passes as, a, as I go through. Now, the last time I was in Montreal was actually for CUSAC in 2018. And CUSAC was one of my favorite experiences throughout my entire undergrad, definitely like foundational to my undergraduate experience. That being said, I think I attended maybe four talks total. <laughs> I spent most of my time uh, at tw like in the 2018 QSEC, just like wandering around Montreal, meeting cool people like you. So I gotta say, for all of you who have chosen to stay and listen to, to me for the final talk, I mean, thank you so much. Uh, I gotta say, I'm, I'm both very, I feel really, a lot of gratitude, and I'm also really impressed. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, having attended QSEC myself, I know that by the time the last talk rolls around, there's no way we're gonna cram more technical stuff into your brains. You've probably spent all, all weekend just like talking to recruiters, learning all sorts of interesting things. So we're just gonna tell some stories. <laughs> now, um, when I was writing this, I had one goal in mind, and that was, how do I tell all of you the things that I wish I had heard back in, in my first year? And that's because I, I, I've stumbled into a lot of really weird but awesome opportunities, and it always felt kind of like luck. Um, and so the only way I thought I could, or I guess I realized as I was brainstorming, the only way that I could express that to you was to tell you those stories. And then to tell you the lessons I learned from those things, and how I used that to increase what I call my surface area for serendipity, the chances that I could run into lucky opportunities. So yeah, let's start with the first story. Now, in high school, I was a bit of a recluse. Like I would stay at home, or like I would go to I would go to class and do all my homework and all of those important things. But then I would like rush home so that I could play Call of Duty alone in my basement, which was not awesome. <laughs> I was cracked at Call of Duty though, um, but it was a bit of a lonely thing. Um, so now my high school was a little bit weird though. We had this requirement for graduation, you had to have a certain number of extracurricular like credits, and I was doomed, right? It was my final year, I hadn't really participated, uh, and so I looked to one of my friends. Uh, I lovingly referred to him for years as my hero, Alaki and Jayakumar, who I refer to as, as Lucky. And so I looked to Lucky, who was president of the Environmental Council at the time, I'm like, dude, help me, <laughs> I'm screwed. And he goes, don't worry bro, I got you. And so he, he brought me onto the team. And uh, as much as I love Lucky, I remember thinking to myself, there's no way anything could be lamer than being a part of the Environmental Council in my high school. Uh, dumb take now, <laughs> the environment's cool, uh, but that was what was going through my head. That being said, I will never forget the first time I walked into one of those meetings. Lucky had taken the time to like, talk me up to all of the people who were there. Uh, he introduced me and, and like, said all sorts of nice things about me that maybe weren't entirely true. <laughs> and so when I walked in, everyone was really, really excited to see me. Um, and they, they introduced themselves and they rushed to say hi and they invited me out to things. And it sounds kind of sad, but that was the first time anyone had really been that excited to see me. <laughs> Especially people that I didn't really know. And I remember the room, the, the energy that those people had. They were so excited and it was contagious. The fact that they, they were just going out and trying to plan events. They were like collaborating with local elementary schools and setting goals. They, they wanted to teach kids about recycling and, and they were like helping them get their hands dirty and build gardens that I think ours is still out there at the high school that, that I went to. And so what I learned from them was community is, is, is everything, right? And it was the first step to me to expanding my surface area for serendipity. I went from me, 
all of the lucky, happy things that could happen to me, just me, to all of the lucky things that could happen to this community of people. And I took that with me. This was one of my most important lessons. If, if you take nothing else from this talk, this is the one. Um, when I got to my undergrad first year, the first thing I did was show up to our computer science society. At Guelph, it's the Society of Computing and Information Sciences. And because of that, I stumbled into so many things. I got to come to QSEC in 2018 because I showed up. Right? I got to run Roboticon, which is this like big recruiting Lego robotics competition at Guelph. Um, all because like I continued to show up, I continued to participate in that community, and lucky things just sort of happened to me. Right? All of these serendipitous things. Okay, story number two. Now, story number two is kind of fun. It revolves around a, a central figure whose name I will not use because a little bit of rule breaking happens in this story. Like, safe rule breaking, but still. Uh, so, my friend Frank, Frank, uh, he, I met him in first year, and he was an interesting character, like kind of the eccentric genius type. He wanted to be a vet, and he was like, I'm gonna become a vet, I'm gonna get into vet college in second year. Now, for those of you who have like vet friends or people who are in that route, that's crazy. <laughs> that's not possible, except for Frank. So, he was in the engineering program, actually, uh, and he was there because he thought, okay, this is where I'm gonna get the most connections, this is where I'm gonna find the most opportunities. But he broke a couple of interesting rules that people think are mandatory. Like, he didn't actually take any mandatory engineering courses. He took biology courses and like agriculture courses because those were gonna be useful to him. He wasn't gonna finish his engineering degree anyways. But this, this is my favorite part. Frank did his fourth year research project in first year. Again, if any of you like have done those research projects, you know that you can't do that. You can't do that. And so he spent all of his time designing a really, really good research project. There was a, a solid experimental paradigm. He did the literature review. He planned out the logistics. He knew the metrics and the forms of analysis he was going to do. And so it was a good project. And then he brought it to a professor, first year, not in the agricultural department, but he brought it to that professor. And because it was a good idea, the professor was like, yeah, I'm down. I want to work with you. But Admin won't let it happen. You don't have the prereqs. And so this is where the rules get bent a little. <laughs> Frank goes, Admin's already signed off on it, man. We're good. <laughs> and so the prof says, well, I mean, if Admin's down, this is a great project. Let's do it. And so he signs the paper. And then Frank like wanders over to the Admin office. And Admin goes, yeah, I mean, we're not allowed to let you take that fourth year course. But the reason we're not allowed to let you take that course is because those prerequisites are in place so that you have the skills needed to succeed. If the prof thinks you've got what it takes, then why not? <laughs> and so just like that, he was in. He got to do his project, and man, he killed it. Like, I, w I got dragged into that project too. Uh, it was awesome, and he did really, really good work. And so what I learned from him was that those administrative guidelines, prerequisites, maybe in industry, those like, you need five years of Java development for this junior development position. Like, come on, man. <laughs> um, those things aren't real. You can bend them. If you have the skills and the initiative and you can learn those things on the fly, you don't have to be ready when you, when you find that opportunity. You can learn as you go. So that's what I learned from Frank. And I took that, I took that with me um, actually right away. In the first year, I wanted, to do, I wanted to work with this professor called Professor Weinberg. Not called, named, <laughs> but uh, he was doing this interesting work in evolutionary algorithms, and at the time I was like really into genetics, which is a weird thing for me to be into, but whatever. And um, but again, I didn't have any of the skills, right? Evolutionary algorithms—that's a complex thing. And I was in first year; I didn't, I hadn't taken data structures, I had none of the prereqs. So I went up to him and I was like, "I want to help. I want to work. What can I do?" He said, "Why don't you take my master's course when you when you like when you're done?" I said. Okay, that's fine, but what if I can do it this summer? So, well, you don't have any of the prereqs. You're not allowed to take a master's course as an undergrad. Um, I said, well, I wasn't going to bend the rules as far as Frank. <laughs> so I asked him instead. I said, look, why don't you help advocate for me? Right? Let's just go down to admin. Let's talk to them and see. Maybe we can figure something out. And so we did. And I didn't get a credit for this, but they let me audit the course. And so I showed up every day in the summer for this course. Um, but the credit wasn't what mattered, right? The, what was important was that I got one-on-one -on -one time with this professor learning advanced computer science topics way before I was ready to do that. 
right? Uh, and and it paid dividends. Like I got, I talked about this during interviews. Uh, I used those evolutionary algorithms in some of like my machine learning stuff every now and then. And it's like I never would have done that without them. So how does this relate back to surface area for serendipity? How, how does this make me luckier? Well, I went from just me to a network. Well, what happens after that is there's this circle of things that people don't think are really possible. And all of a sudden, they're maybe possible to me. right? And all of those opportunities are open to me. Cool. Third story. So this is about how my friends and I founded the Computing Councils of Canada, or uh, we call it lovingly C-cubed. So c -cubed spawned out of the drudgery of COVID. Now, all of my stories you've heard so far are like from first year or high school, something like that. At this point, I'm in fourth year. I know I want to drive community. I've learned how to lead it, and I know that's where I belong. Um, and so I was really bummed, right? Like all of my friends had sort of taken up leadership positions in undergrad. We were ready to lead that community, and everything we had planned, COVID just threw a wrench in it. But once again, I was saved by one of my, one of my lovely friends, my friend Ben, uh, who actually drove me up here <laughs> this weekend. So shout out Ben. Um, he, re he, he noticed that this might have been actually an opportunity. If we're running all of our events on Zoom, maybe everyone else is. And maybe we can start reaching out. So he said, why don't, we, why don't we reach out to Laurier and see if the Laurier Computing Society is also running Zoom events. Maybe we can collaborate with them. And so I threw it back to him. Like, well, if distance isn't a problem, why don't we reach out to everybody, right? And so we did. I, I remember that night I went home and I found as many Computer Science Society emails as I could. I think it was about 18 and I drafted up this email asking if they wanted to collaborate and I almost didn't send it. I remember sitting there and this dread like washed over me. And there were two things that just scared the hell out of me. One was, what if this is an awful idea and nobody cares? <laughs> what, if, what if this is useless and I'm wasting everybody's time? Two, what if it's a great idea and everybody shows up and I promise that I can help them and I'm just not enough? And I almost didn't send those emails. But luckily, I had learned from, uh, I had learned from my friend Lucky and from Frank. One, community is everything. And this was my opportunity to build a larger community than, than I had ever thought possible. And so it wasn't just me, my chance to build my surface area for serendipity. It was an opportunity to build that for possibly hundreds, maybe thousands. Um, and so I felt like I had a responsibility to do that in the same way that people had built community for me and given me those opportunities. And the other thing was what I learned from Frank, which is just because I'm not ready to do it now, just because I don't have those skills today, doesn't mean that I'm not capable of learning them as I go. Uh, and uh, God, I learned a lot. <laughs> so I sent the emails, and within like six hours, I think, 12 universities responded back, and everybody was stoked. Right? They were like really, really excited to be a part of this. They thought this was a great idea. And, then, and so we ran that meeting. And I took like half an hour to introduce myself, and like, hey, this, these are my ideas about how we could collaborate, all of that stuff. And when I finally shut up, <laughs> and handed the microphone over, like so to speak, to the floor, it just caught fire in this phenomenal, exciting way. Everyone was, was using their skills in, these, in, in their unique ways. Like some people were splitting off to think about, oh, how do we design logos? How do we design a website for this, right? How do we, how do we start reaching out to industry sponsors so that we can, we can run events? What kinds of events can we run? How do we design a constitution to make sure that every student that we serve gets served properly and equally? And so I looked at that and I realized the lesson that I got from that was if an opportunity doesn't exist, but it's built on an idea that can really help people, right? That's exciting and engaging. Chances are other people have thought of it. They just might not be ready to take that leap. They, may, they might need a little encouragement and you can be that encouragement. You can create the opportunities uh, for yourself and for others. So, Let's see, how did, I, how did I use that lesson to find other opportunities? Uh, actually, at the research position, if you were here for the, uh, what was it called, the new grads panel, I talked about this a little bit. My research position at UFT, I got by cold emailing, just like I cold emailed those universities. I realized 
I spent a lot of my undergrad working on extracurriculars, and sometimes it's hard to fit those onto a resume in an impressive way. And so I thought maybe I wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't get in if I went through the, the usual process of application. So I needed to find another chance. So I emailed out to a couple of professors, uh, and luckily one of them got back to me, Joseph Williams at the Intelligent Adaptive Interventions Lab at U of T. <laughs> and uh, he just said, oh, look, I, I don't have time to like, meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, but why don't you come to our lab? Why don't you come to our lab meeting? I thought, yeah, <laughs> are you kidding me? So I did, uh, and again, this was the serendipitous moment for me. I was in that meeting, and one of the teams needed extra hands on deck. Like, they just had too much work. And that was my chance, right? So I showed up, and I, and, and I volunteered to help. And I kept showing up, and I kept volunteering, until eventually I was like an integral part of this lab. And so when it came down to application time, it's a little bit of a no-brainer. <laughs> I've been there for like eight months. So that's the lesson. How does that increase my surface area for serendipity? Well. Now, we've gone from single person to network to things where you bend the rules a little bit to now I'm taking charge. Now when there's an opportunity that I want and it doesn't exist, I get to make it. That's how much larger my surface area grows. Okay, so that's sort of the last story, I promise. I wanna do a little bit of a sum up now. You've all heard for the last like 15 minutes or so, the things that I'm proud of. And those are the things that I did do. But what about the things that I regret? What are those? Well, I didn't go to CS Games. Uh, I wanted to. My friends always talked about it, and I was super excited. But again, that, that creeping feeling in the back of my head, what if, what if I don't have the skills yet? You know, Maybe I'll go after I take data structures. That's when I'll be ready. That's when I'll be able to contribute. And so when I finally found the time to go, it was fourth year, we were all lined up, and COVID hit. I didn't get to go. Okay. Also, I, I didn't go to a lot of hackathons, which is weird because community and cool tech, like those are kind of my things. <laughs> and, uh, but it was the same thing. What if I'm not ready? What if I don't know enough to build something interesting? What if, uh, well, maybe I just don't have the time, right? Like I've, ugh, I've got an assignment due on Monday, right? But again, you can bend things. You can ask for an extension. You can make time, and I didn't, and I regret that. And lastly, I had an opportunity in second and third year to be a research assistant, and that one really stings, because <laughs> I'm in academia, and it would have been awesome. Uh, but I missed it, because again, I thought, well, maybe, maybe I just don't have the skills. Maybe, maybe I don't have the time, because my courses are already killing me, and I'm, I'm in all these extracurriculars. But I could have spent less time on my courses. I was doing fine. What I should have done is prioritize the things that I was passionate about, and that was, that was research and working with people. So let's look at those two things. The things that I'm proud of are the things that I did. The things that I regret are the things that I didn't do, not the things that I screwed up. And by the way, I screwed up a lot of things disastrously. Let's take Roboticon second, the second time I ran Roboticon. This was the first time I was running it solo. I, on day two, I broke the track. <laughs> so we had these Lego robotics competitions and I had this huge oversight, something about the crazy shiny lights made it so that the robots couldn't read the track. And it was just doomed. 250 students came from all over Ontario to play or to, to do this competition, and I broke it. Now, we found a workaround that was a little sketchy, but it, it mostly worked. And so I guess I salvaged it. But it was still a huge screw up. But that's still not something I regret. That's, that's something I'm proud of. So when I look at this, what I've learned is the reason I'm not worried about screwing up is because there's always time to try something else again, right? But specific opportunities, those windows close. They pass you by, and if you don't take them, they don't come back. So I regret the things that I didn't do. Okay, one short last story, and then it's done, <laughs> I swear. So. Again, when I was graduating high school, my uncle gave me a book called The Icarus Deception. And I won't get into you know, the Greek myth stuff. Maybe you're not all Greek myth nerds like I am. But the important part is Icarus is where we get the phrase, don't fly too close to the sun. And that's a metaphor for like, uh, don't push too far beyond your boundaries. Like, don't, don't try too hard. Um, and that's okay, right? Hubris is a bad thing. Overconfidence isn't great. But 
The second part, the part that doesn't like pervade culture, doesn't didn't really seep in, is Icarus was also warned not to fly too low, or he'd be swallowed up by the sea or something. I don't know. Um, and that's a metaphor for not sticking too close to your comfort zone, not underselling yourself, not being complacent. And when so many of us are struggling with imposter syndrome, that's the lesson that matters. That's the one that should have stuck. So if I'm going to sum up all of this in one lesson, right, you've, you've heard my theories. Be a part of community, right? Contribute to community, and it will contribute back to you. Two prerequisites, requirements, you can learn those on the fly. You can bend those a little, especially if, you, if, if you've got people that you're kind to and, you can, and can ask for help. Three, if opportunities don't exist and you want them, you can make them. And all of this comes from one major idea, which is I'd rather try and fail than have failed to try. Thanks. story about when you started in high school you were kind of like uh, you, you felt a little bit outcast in comparison to when you got started mm -hmm. and so what I was sort of curious about is for you um, how like distinctly do you see yourself as like a high school student or like well, when you try to convey stories to other people um, how do you convey that portion of you in comparison to how you are now um, yeah so I mean it's like this I, I tell these stories right and because that kind of change doesn't happen quickly it's really hard to go from you know sort of really introverted really scared of trying and, and, and fear of failure to like, yeah, I'll just, I'll just come, I'll come to Montreal and give a speech. I'll wing that, no problem. Um, and so I, I think um, I just encourage people to take small steps towards the things that make them uncomfortable regularly. And that, that'll get you there. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, as someone who enjoys the same thing as your community, computer science, and making yourself uncomfortable, mm -hmm. it's it's a very tough thing to do, mm -hmm. pushing yourself. How are you consistent with that? Sorry? How are you consistent in pushing yourself? Um, I guess I realize that I'm more afraid of regretting missing things than I am of that momentary discomfort, right? Because that's... That's how long it lasts. It takes about 20 minutes of courage to do this. Um, it will be years of me thinking, man, I could have done that. And so I think I, I just weigh that out. Um, and it, it's hard, but yeah, that's how we do it. How do you balance, like, taking as many cool opportunities as you can and not being way too busy? <laughs> <laughs> that is a fantastic question uh, because I have done that. I have definitely, like, I'll just say yes to everything, and then I burn out, right? Like, it's, it's really hard. Um, it takes time. It takes practice. Uh, I think when you, when you start that sort of journey, uh, you will suffer with burnout. The important thing is to remember that, like, that's not a personal failing, right? You didn't fail because you burnt out. You tried a lot of stuff, and you realize for next time, like, okay, this is where capacity is, and I'll protect my capacity for next time. And you'll probably screw it up a couple times and burn out a couple times, but every time you learn a little bit, a little bit better, just say no, just a little bit more, right? So um, yeah, I would say keep trying, but um, you're on the right track. Yep. Yeah. Just out of like, what do you usually do to recover from those burnouts? Like for me, as someone who also like goes for research positions as a first year and mm -hmm. already did that. Mm -hmm. But like there would be times where you just burn out and like practically dead inside for a month. Like what usually do you do like recover? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um so I'll, I'll give like two two views. So there's there's me before, <laughs> pre several burnouts where I didn't know what the heck I was doing, and I would just like I would burn out and I would get mad, right? I'm just like, why? Why can't I do this? <laughs> like, why am I not enough? Um, and it was it was not good, right? So I, I learned some sort of coping mechanisms and things like that. Mostly, um, I can see it coming a little bit better, and so I can warn people. I can say like, hey, I've taken on a lot. I can tell I'm burning out. I'm going to need some time off in a little bit. Uh, can, can we dial things back a little bit in preparation for that? So a, a lot of communicating with, with the people that I work with to let them know, I'm going to need some time soon. Uh, and then once I get there, uh, you just have to remember, yeah, you just have to remember, like, 
not to not to continue working while you're in that like recovery period. Try to like do things other than that. Treat yourself kindly. Go watch a movie. It's okay to not be super productive in that time. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So that's all I've got. All I've got time for. Thank you all so much for listening to me. I hope you had a great time at QSEC.